Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 52! We made it! How the hell we made it? What? That's in madness. One whole year. Whole year. Ah! Of this podcasting malarkey. It's crazy to think it's been one year. We're really milking oh, this no, for absolutely. everything God, it's yeah. worth. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much to everyone who is listening now. If you've just joined us or whether you've been with us from day one, we love you. We so appreciate everyone who's made this podcast happen and has allowed us to carry on for a year, just churning these horrible, horrible (laughs) stories out. People love the horrible, horrible stories. They really do. Ah, Nick, how are you? (laughs) That sounded weird. I'm sorry. That sounded very weird. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say something else and then I went, how are you? (laughs) feeling slightly haunted now. Um, (laughs) I was okay. <laughs> okay, instead of how are you, what have been your season one highlights? Oh, ooh, ooh, I mean, so many. So many good cocktails, so many good Many, stories. many good drinks, many hangovers. So much witty banter. So much. A painful amount sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Look how far we've come. <laughs> it's all grown up. It's all grown up. We've discovered many, many things about poisons, about just how many people are idiots. Yes, discovered many things. I probably would have been best non-discovering, but... I know, yes. I know them. So, what have been your season one highlights? What have you learnt from the uh, from the poisonous cabinet? Particular shout out to my cousin in law, Amy, who posted on Instagram the other day her washing rice twice because of us saying about <laughs> that it makes arsenic. <laughs> yeah, that's it's right. That's handy right. Handy life hacks that we provide, an invaluable service as well as entertaining. Everyone now has a top hat. Quite right, quite right. Are they mute? They didn't before. Yes, and a drinking problem. <laughs> yes, I think we probably <laughs> encouraged alcoholism quite substantially. Well, we've discovered things like the red hook. I never would have discovered a red hook if it wasn't for this show. I so think. many, many good cocktails. I mean, the Martinez the, with the Geneva. Oh. That was uh, that was one that sent us all insane. Ooh, revelation. The Mezcal cocktail that actually contained chartreuse that I liked. Yes, indeed. <laughs> That yep. didn't cancel out all the other terrible chartreuse <laughs> cocktails. The Golden Cadillac. Uh, let's just move on from that. <laughs> there have been ups and downs, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly ups. Mostly, mostly ups. Up. Dizzying highs, but then it's only further to fall. Wow, it's getting dark, Nick. It's getting dark and deep. Well, speaking of being dark and deep and dizzying highs and crushing lows, I think it's time to thank our Patreon subscribers. They are surely the dizzying highs of it all. Thank you so much to uh, to Cathy Thomas. To Leanne May. To Amanda Coughlin. To Chris Ollinger. I knew your eyes could have to try. <laughs> now, I apologise when I butcher your name. To Patronit Levanskel. To Kaya. And to Alison Scott. See, I can say that one. <laughs> and uh, to Patronit, who sent us a very lovely message on Patreon. Did indeed. And this is how you repay them. <laughs> <laughs> we really yes. hope we got that right. We love you all. You're very, very sexy, very You're sexy Patreon subscribers. People. And guys, as we've said on social media, this is the end of season one. We have a tiny, tiny minuscule break before season two. Just a mere two weeks when the main episode will be on pause. But Patreon continues in the background and we have asked our gorgeous Patreon subscribers and they have agreed that we will release one of our Patreon episodes on the main show in the interim. So you'll get a free taster of our Patreon content while we're off writing all the stories for season two. All of them, by the way. 52 stories. We're going to write them all at once. You're going to do them all in one go. Definitely, definitely. So, yep, get a tempt you with some tasty, tasty Deadly Nightcaps episodes. Just one free taste and you'll be hooked i'm sure (laughs) and your hand over your hard one cash (laughs) five dollars a month yes one down the gambling halls badly absolutely (laughs) one on the on on the dogs (laughs) i'm sure you're all avid greyhound racers of course Um, yes it is the most fashionable place to be absolutely these days you wear your top hat and your monocle bring your portable poisonous cabinet cocktail making kit and have a lovely night screaming that's how all nights are (laughs) <laughs> well, Nick. Yes. Are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? You know, otherwise, now would be madness. I mean, we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. End of season one, go out on a bang. Not when we have come so far. <laughs> we'll go with the first one. We'll go with the first one. Well, it is episode 52. Yes. And whose story is it this week, Nick? Well, we have something a bit different for episode 52, um, as you would expect. You expect nothing less from the Poisonous Cabinet. It is scheduled to be my episode this week, but 
instead of just hearing me prattle on for um, a couple of hours, um, as Sinead often gets to <laughs> gets to hear before <laughs> editing it down to something manageable, you'll get a story from both of us. We have two, two stories this week. Stories. Very, very exciting stories. Yes, we have got two stories and we are going head to head this week with two very famous historic alleged poisoners. We have got Lucretia Borgia versus Catherine de Medici. It's a, it's, a po- it's a poison it's off. a poison off it's two queens <laughs> one queen and one noble woman two women of noble blood fighting Indeed. each other to the death <laughs> <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of scratching and hair pulling going on there's a lot of white wine getting drunk dramatic historic scene. queens modern queens much the same thing it's all the same it's all the same i am so excited for this episode because lucretia borgia uh, the the most referenced poisoner in all of our stories in all of the cases that we've covered there's always whoever the murderer is they're always called oh it's the local Borgia or it's the Brooklyn Borgia oh yes I mean we, we've had the Brooklyn Borgia we've had the Belgian Borgia oh, the Belgian Borgia as well they just um, make them up as they go along the down the street Borgia the uh, over there Borgia the sitting down <laughs> Borgia so finally we get to talk about Lucretia Borgia and where did this incredible so reputation come from quite a reputation to live up oh, to oh it's really. good and also one of my favourite figures from history a short history but a fantastic woman Catherine de Medici or uh, de Medici or de Medici depending how you like to say it <laughs> yeah or cat or cat cat oh we shortened her to cat kitty <laughs> <laughs> so two stories for you this week but if we're going to do two stories we can't we can't we can't possibly even approach starting to tell them without a cocktail in hand Yay. My God, no. And as ever, we have picked a secret ingredient inspired by the tales that we're telling that will flavour our cocktail of the week. And this week's secret ingredient is, Nick? Is is the blood of the nobility. Blue blood. <laughs> the blood of the aristocracy. <laughs> and yep. we've killed a king. We have killed many kings. We have. He wasn't a good king or an no. important <clears throat> king. He was a minor king, but he gave us some blood after we killed him. <laughs> What? <laughs> and there we have. No, we. I jest. I jest. I jest. We haven't killed a king or any one of the minor royals. So, with blue blood as our inspiration, Nick, what have you come up with? Well, well, well. As befits episode fifty-two mm-hmm. and our dual story. Okay. We're going crazy. It's a crazy mad time, and we're going to have two cocktails this week. Yay! So, uh, yeah, so hold on to your hats, everyone. It's going to get crazy. <laughs> two cocktails for two stories for two people. Ah, it's, it's, it's two. And it's two, yes. It's two. So for our first cocktail this week, mm-hmm. we are going to have a gunmetal blue. Oh, okay, good. Taking the blue, I can sense taking the blue as the inspiration for the name. Yes. Rather so than have, we, it, taking it some blue. blood of the king. There and, is no king's blood involved in this. It's just a... Just a gunmetal blue, which is no. a good name for a cocktail. I think that is nice. I love the colour gunmetal blue. Well, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what it, if it is indeed blue. Well, without further ado, it's time for us to drink. Nick has ever delivered me the secret ingredients for this week. So it is time for us to go into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Uh, hello. Ooh, a gunmetal blue. It's a blue cocktail. It is. It's blue. It's I'm so excited. Blue. I'm so excited because we haven't done a blue cocktail yet. We haven't. This is the first first time. Yay. And it is splendidly blue. It is really blue. I must compliment you on the blueness of the drink, I'm... sir. <laughs> it is most blue. It's I'm... it's almost like, oh God, actually looking at it, I'm thinking it reminds me of a of a beautiful Mediterranean sea. It does, yes. Grecian waters. It's that kind of blue and now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> because we are in snowy, snowy southeast England. Exactly. Get over it and drink, it'll be fine. We'll just pretend exactly. we're on the beach in a minute in the dark in the snow. Blue drinks. Now I have a soft spot for blue drinks because people think they're party drinks, they think they're all usually sweet or WKD blue or anything. But uh yeah, a blue <laughs> drink can go well. So I, I have theories on what might be in it. You're not gonna tell me, are you? I have oh, to taste I'm it not. first. You, you know the <laughs> okay. rules by now. <laughs> so oh it's it's got an interesting odour. Not unpleasant. Mm. Okay, all right, all right. Well, it's time to taste the gunmetal blue. Very, Cheers. very blue and beautiful. Cheers, Merry Christmas. Let's dive in. Ooh. Oh, that's interesting. Ooh, I like that. Do- mm. Or do I? Wait, 
<laughs> Wait, do I? Yes? I so. No? What? Oh, it's an interesting one. one. The first taste is really nice because it's quite, it's a combination of sharp and I think there's mezcal in it. I feel like there's mezcal in it. I might be wrong. But then it does have quite a sweet sort of candy aftertaste. Uh, ooh, interesting. It's interesting, that one. Yeah, we'll talk us through it, Nick. I demand to know. Okay. I, I need answers. <laughs> well, you're spot on. Uh, we have mezcal. Woohoo! Um, so the, the temptation to do our chartreuse cocktail. Um, <laughs> for episode 52. And I thought, no, uh, uh... I'm going to be nice. So we made a mezcal cocktail. Ooh! for mission aid yeah. so yeah so we have mezcal now unsurprisingly the blue does come from blue curacao yeah um, which i like if you have a bottle of it in the cupboard maybe it's been left over from some sort of party or you made weird colored cocktails but you run out of triple sec it's basically the same thing it's, it's blue. exactly the same thing but blue yeah so blue margaritas all round well exactly i mean there are so many other blue cocktails which are just variants of things that have triple sec in there's mm-hmm. a blue lady which is yes. a white lady, but you're I make that frequently. Blue curacao rather than a triple sec or normal mm-hmm. curacao. Uh, yeah, there's blue margaritas. There's you can get weird blue cosmopolitans. So yeah, anything with tri- with triple sec, use blue curacao if you fancy. But anyway, back to back to the back to this one. Um, <laughs> there is a lime, a bit of Ooh, lime nice. in there. So, so there's nice citrus. Here. Yep, an ingredient we have never yet used on this. Is it kindness? No, there is none of that around here. <laughs> Shame. It is peach. <laughs> Peach liqueur, oh, which we have never yet, never yet, we, we have never yet used, never yet this. used. No, no, we've indeed, not so. used peaches. You'd think something like Typhoid Mary, which is too short a story. It's not really a murder story, but yeah, she did peaches, <laughs> didn't she? But yeah, we haven't used peach yet. So this no. is so a peach liqueur rather than a schnapps, I suppose. Yes, yeah, so this is a bit different. A, yes, it's a peach, yeah, peach peach liqueur. Now it called for cinnamon syrup. Oh, oh. my cinnamon syrup. I had not sterilized the bottle and it has gone mouldy. Um, so I did not use that. And so I've just used sugar syrup. So there's okay. meant to be a bit of a, a hint of cinnamon in there, which unfortunately we are lacking. Okay. I'd be interested to see what it was like with cinnamon. But yeah, an interesting cocktail. Mezcal, yummy. Blue curacao, delicious. Little sugar syrup, lime, all very good until we get to the peach liqueur. It's the peach that throws it. It does because it's perfumed. And the as I said, the first taste really nice and then you're left with this aftertaste that is quite synthetic i would say a little bit too sweet it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination it's just it's disappointing after that lovely lovely first also go potentially due to the the peach that i had which is not the best quality (laughs) right it's just a supermarket peach liqueur Uh, but it wasn't one of the like the Briote ones, where I usually mm. use the maraschino and the lychee and stuff like that, which mm. are really high quality. So the ones, so the one I've got is probably yeah, is slightly artificial flavorings rather than um, actual fruit in there. So that probably doesn't help. Well, that's it. You can only get. But that's what, what I had to hand. We, we invest in a lot of stuff. We don't really. I mean, this is the first time in not only the poisonous cabinet, but I think ever we've had a cocktail together that had peach in it. Yeah. Peach is just a random flavour. I think it's the years and years and years I spent drinking Arches, well, Arches and, and Lemonade. lemonade. Yeah. And now it's just that there's, there's, I can't do it anymore. I just, I just can't. It brings back terrible <laughs> memories, that kind of sickly sweet smell of a night out. <laughs> I don't know whether it would be vastly improved with a more refined peach liqueur. To be honest, I'm not going to buy a bottle to find out because I no, fear I would be it. disappointed. It's a nice cocktail. It looks stunning. If you like peach, if you are an Arches fan or if you like a peach liqueur, definitely mix it up because it would be a, a beautiful twist on a mm. favorite for you okay well i like it ish <laughs> <laughs> well i mean don't forget we have got a yet a second one to go that's why i'm being a little bit more critical than normal because normally i'd be like oh yeah it's fine but i know there's another one there like yeah yeah it's down this let's go well with our gunmetal blue cocktails in hand, quite comfortably in hand. It's okay. We'll let them come along for the ride. Uh, I think it's time for story number one. Well, Yay! quite. In our Blue Blood special, it's your turn first, I think, Nick. Yes, indeed. We have the Battle of the Italian Families, yeah. um, really, the Medicis and the Borgias. I'm going to tell the story of Lucretia Borgia. And what better way to start any story than with a corpse? Great. It's a good, it's a good solid start to a story. It's a good start to a day. Yeah, this is not any old corpse. This is a very fancy corpse. A corpse dressed in the very finest of clothes, with the sparkliest of gold and jewels, and spectacularly of all, the biggest of fanciest of hats any of the mourners had ever seen. 
Yay! Oh, I hope everyone is wearing their <laughs> end of season big fancy poisonous cabinet hat. If Absolutely. you're not, pause now, go put it on, take a picture of you drinking, and then listen. Oh my god, okay, so big hat, big hat on the corpse. On the corpse, absolutely. Big Going fancy hat. style, like it. Well, exactly. Going in style four. Lying in the Sistine Chapel, the heart of the Vatican City, Pope Alexander VI lies dead. No. And of course, he is bedecked in all his regalia and finery. All of his hats. And the biggest hat that they could find. <laughs> He is illuminated by hundreds of candles, all sparkling. It's a very, very atmospheric scene. Well, he's dead. Well, he's dead, but it's all... But it's, <laughs> they I mean, have it's, just it's got a... the big light on over his head. No. Someone put on the big light. <laughs> Someone like... put on the big light. Turn the big light off. It's Put the big light on. We can see it. <laughs> you can imagine there's like a choir of nuns in a corner, sort okay. of doing chanting things. There's some monks at the other side. Also chanting in lower Also tones. chanting, trying to, yeah, trying to chant louder. It's like glee, but weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and as the mourners file past and peer at the, the dead man's face, they struggle to suppress their revulsion. The face is so swollen, it is unrecognisable. And the skin has turned mottled black and blue. And the stench is overwhelming. Ugh. Okay. So it's not, a, it's not a particularly happy scene. Yeah. But obviously they, they file past and pay their respects to the, the Holy Father. Holy Father. Certain Catholics would just be like, I don't care what he smells like. Go and pay your respects. Well, exactly, We're yeah. getting into heaven. Precisely, yeah. Amongst the assembled crowd, there are whispers. What has caused this sight that we, we see before us? And the whispers go round that the Pope has been poisoned. <gasps> poisoned. Could it really be true? Would anyone dare do such a thing? Had this man died how he had lived? Ooh. Now, you may not be familiar with Pope Alexander VI. Uh, He's not high on my list of popes. But you will be familiar with his family, Mm -hmm. a dynasty that has become synonymous with intrigue, treachery and revenge. Borgia. Borgia. Now, the, the Borgias were outsiders to Rome, and none of the noble families that they tried to inveigle their way into would let them forget it. Alphonse de Borgia, <laughs> very fancy yeah, Alphonse I know. Borgia, <laughs> had been a diplomat for the kings of Aragon in Spain. And in recognition for his service, he had been made Bishop of Valencia. Very nice. And from there on, his career in the church had flourished. And in 1444, he was made a cardinal. Now, at this time, again, Nick's history lesson going on here. (laughs) (laughs) This time, Catholic Church is not just a religion. It's a way of life. It is what it is. It is a way of life. It is a state. Mm. It is a country in its own right. Um, It controls cities, towns. It has armies ready to expand its influence. The Pope is not only the head of a church, but he is a head of state. He is a king. Cardinals are not only senior clergy, but they are diplomats and governors and sometimes even military commanders. They live a very different life to what we would expect them today. The power cannot be underestimated. Indeed not. Now, many cardinals and popes amassed huge wealth, mainly selling favours, taking backhanders from those who needed access. You want to build a church? You want us to use your stone for these things? Then grease my palm with silver and I'm sure you'll get the contract. (laughs) They became incredibly wealthy and soon Alfonso was one of the very best at working the system and he lived like a prince. Alphonse's nephew, Rodrigo Borgia, was sent to live with his uncle to study the ways of the church and the ways of politics. In 1455, Cardinal Alphonse de Borgia was elected Pope himself, but he, he was old and he was seen by many as much more of a, of a caretaker Pope. He's not going to be around too long and it gives others time to plan and put their pieces in power and pieces in the yeah. right position to get who they really want as, as Pope. While we work stuff out yeah, exactly. and figure out how how we can get more power you just sit there you just sit there look pretty keep the hat keep, thing, keep things ticking along and that's what he was to, to many people he took the name calixtus the third and one and two were, were so notable as well I'll absolutely i mean them. they go down yeah. in history you never forget them but one of his first actions of pope uh, was to make his 24 year old nephew uh, rodrigo a cardinal rodrigo borgia is now a cardinal 
Well, well, fair enough. I mean, despite his young age, Rodrigo has learned incredibly well from the, the time he has spent in his uncle's household, and he swiftly grows in power and influence. Within a few years, he was one of the wealthiest men in all of Rome. He has palaces, huge households, country estates, and all the trappings of a, a luxury lifestyle. Many of the other powerful families in Rome, such as the Medicis and the Forzas, grew incredibly jealous of this upstart house (laughs) and their increasing power and influence and a fierce competition grows about who is going to be the most powerful who is going to wield the most control a lot of shaking of fists there's a huge amount of shaking cross piazzas (laughs) absolutely (laughs) now the college of cardinals is proved right and pope calixtus dies four years later nothing untoward suspected about his death he was just an old man now many thought that without the protection of the pope cardinal rodrigo would falter and his enemies would get the upper hand but they are all proved drastically wrong this is an incredibly violent time and if diplomacy doesn't work to resolve your disputes then it is commonplace to resort to manipulation bribery threats and murder poisoning is incredibly common oh yeah the career of the professional poisoner is born in italy and they have schools dedicated to teaching the the subtle art of of the poisoner and this flourishes especially in rome the house of borgia goes from strength to strength and in despite of his cardinal's vows rodrigo's mistress Vanosa di Caletti bears him four children. Now, this is hardly uncommon at this time. Many churchmen would have illegitimate children, but Rodrigo is different. He is adamant that his family will be looked after and respected, and he fully supports his four children, Giovanni, Geoffrey, Cesar, and Lucretia. Oh, that's that's the woman. That's, that's the that's, woman. That's you the said woman. it. You that's, said that's, it. That's the, that's the name of the woman that we know. <laughs> and Joffrey was there. Bloody hell. Yes, Game I know. Of Thrones. <laughs> They're all there. <laughs> Lucretia Borgia, a name that over five hundred years later is inseparable from poison. Oh. But as we alluded to, is her reputation really justified? Yes. Uh, yes. Mm. Oh. After the downfall of her family, the name of Borgia was vilified throughout the Italian peninsula and Europe further afield. And the legend surrounding them and that all these apparent misdeeds grows till it is what we know it today. In 1492, Rodrigo Borgia is elected Pope like his uncle had been 37 years before. No one doubts for a second that he has used bribery, threats, violence to ensure his appointment even those who thoroughly disliked the man have a grudging respect for his intelligence um, and his subtlety he gets what he wants but no one dares point the finger there is never any proof of any horrendous misdeed Uh, but things always seem to go his way how convenient how very convenient now as pope he takes the name alexander the sixth his entire reign is widely criticized for massive overspending his luxurious lifestyle and his supreme nepotism (laughs) (laughs) he has made no bones about family comes first ensuring the continuance of his house it's all very Game of Thrones. Yes. <laughs> is, uh, is of the utmost importance to him. He sells off church property and uses proceeds to fund his lifestyle. His first son, Giovanni, is appointed as Captain General of the Papal Army. Another son, Cesar, is appointed a cardinal at the age of 18. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the youngest son, Geoffrey, is married into the crown of Aragon and Naples. In sure, an Indeed. alliance there. But it's Lucretia that is the prize. From childhood, she has been admired for her beauty and grace, her education as well. She's incredibly wise. She speaks Italian and French and Latin and Greek. Mm. She reads poetry and plays instruments, and she is uh, seen as absolute prize to be on any nobleman's arm. But her destiny, as is with all women of noble birth, would be to marry 
to further her father's and her family's ambitions. Livestock, just send them off. Absolutely, there they go. send them off. None of this yak 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 no, no, no. business. Indeed not. Be quiet and do what you're told and go and marry go that off. person over there. Weird man. Weird man. By the time she is 11 years old, an engagement has been arranged to the heir of the Kingdom of Valencia. Quite fancy. Mm-hmm. That's quite fancy. Yeah, Valencia's lovely Valencia, this time of year. Exactly, it's lovely. It's but very nice. only two months later, that contract is annulled and a new engagement is proclaimed to the, the Count of Presidia. No idea what that it, is. It preceded um, Valencia. Absolutely. But obviously... Just before it. An alliance with Valencia was no longer advantageous. And obviously the Count, he is the one to go for now. We need his support. Sexy. After Re- Rodrigo becomes Pope, he decides that even this engagement is now far below his family. He is now Pope. The Borgias are the preeminent family. A new match must be made for Lucretia to someone much more appropriate. And it is arranged that she will marry Giovanni Sforza, um, who is another one of the incredibly wealthy and important houses, families in the area. Just adding to my family tree here yep. of all the families <laughs> of just dragons on one uh, and absolutely. lions on the other. <laughs> blue guns on another one. <laughs> this was the house of the blue guns. What are guns? We're not sure yet. We've got a prototype. It's amazing. <laughs> Lucretia's brother, Césaire, Césaire. Césaire um, proves to be a chip off the old block, just as clever, ruthless, self-interested and political as his father. His enemies disappear. They may turn up in a in a ditch or in a river. <laughs> drunk, drunk, obviously. Drunk, slipped, accidentally cut his head off while shaving. <laughs> <laughs> All of these accidents befell his enemies. In 1497, the eldest Borgia son, Giovanni, who had been made captain general of the the army mm. was murdered in the street no, many why? believe that this was in retribution for some unknown act committed on the orders of the the borgia family Ooh. other rumors went around that it was cesar himself <gasps> that had ordered the murder of his own brother in order to take his position at the head of the papal army oh. such was his has his ambition he needed an army behind him. That same year, the French invaded the Italian peninsula, as the French were wont to do. They love to do that. We fancy some wine. We can go <laughs> into Italy. It's great grapes. Yes. It's got lovely grapes. Let's go down lovely there. Lovely grapes. And they rampage across the countryside um, towards Rome. Um, t- what? I just love the idea of rampaging across the countryside when it's miles. It's hundreds of <laughs> hundreds miles. Hundreds of miles. But they're but rampaging yeah, 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 yeah. The After 30 minutes, <laughs> oh, he really should not have used up all our energy on this first burst. Cesar marches out to meet them, but is furious to discover that the House of Sforza um, allied with the French against him. Now, this is his own brother-in-law, Lucretia's husband. Bastard. He has betrayed them. Um, no. Now, as soon as news of this betrayal reaches the Pope, the marriage is instantly annulled on the slightly dubious grounds that the marriage has not been consummated and that mm. Giovanni Sforza was impotent. Sometimes it took a while. Sometimes it took a while for them to actually consummate because they're like, ooh, I've never met you before. And <laughs> uh, and yeah, then they all went, oh, he's impotent or she's yeah. barren. So it's not valid. Reset. Reset, reset. exactly. Let's do overs. Let's do it again. Giovanni is not too happy about this. He has been humiliated in front of everyone. This public announcement that he is impotent. I mean, that would ring true anywhere. And he has not been able to <laughs> shag his wife. Furious. As you would be, yes. As, well, yeah, exactly, as one would be. And it is him who first starts the rumours of Lucretia's incestuous relationship. Oh, oh, bring the woman down with him. Rumours that will dog the family the next yep hundreds she shags of years. her brothers been shagging her brothers not only brothers but also her father the pope as well which is probably rather unlikely i feel um i, I think oh you're innocent nick <laughs> <laughs> sex with everybody have you okay <laughs> no they had they i didn't what <laughs> there was lots of shagging have There's you not seen sh- the Reine de Margot no, sorry. <laughs> not, did you not see the TV series the Borges is exactly like that everyone had sex with everybody I, I mean I, I hope they didn't mm. they probably did a bit why? Why? Why would you say that? Why? Why do you? Because think it they... was a bit. Well, well there's a lot of rumours that go around about people being discrediting, saying, "Oh, they're incestuous," but there was a lot of incest. 
way back when it was it was you know historians have written about it that it was it's not that it, i'm not condoning it i'm not saying it i'm just saying <laughs> it happened but then it was just used as a tool against people it was one of those things like adultery at the time going everyone was committing adultery and then you use it like he's an adulterer oh burn him yes Incest is slightly worse than that. <laughs> Just, you know. But moving on from the incest. Moving on from that. <laughs> the popes popes have sex with everyone. I don't Why, know. indeed he does. I don't, don't trust the Catholics is what I'm saying. <laughs> now, after a decent interval spent in a convent, uh, <laughs> Lucretia is deemed worthy or fit enough to, to remarry again. Cleansed she's sort of She's sins. been cleansed in a convent for a bit. Yeah, that's what does it. That's yeah. what, that's what, re-virginised. Well she, well, she never had sex to begin with because obviously... Oh, he was... Em- c- yeah. And then she's in there with all the nuns. They have a great time in there. Yeah. <laughs> and this time... Convent's place to be. <laughs> she is married off to Alfonso of Aragon. That's a good name. At the time, Cesar needs the support of the Kingdom of Aragon in his fight against the French. But after a few years, Cesar switches sides and forms an alliance with Louis the Twelfth of France against the Kingdom of Aragon. Bastard. Bastard. He's, he's not over. He's not. He's not a popular man. Alfonso, Lucretia's new husband, is threatened with poison. After a meal with Cesar, he is told, "Don't forget, what didn't happen at lunch may still happen at dinner." Oh, that's great. Oh, I love that line. line. Oh, that's a good poisoner's line. (laughs) You've survived this one. But wait, just wait. What could be the interpretations after that if someone said that to you? What didn't happen at lunch could still happen at dinner. What dessert? Pudding? (laughs) Pineapple upside down cake? Yay! No, you're not really listening to me. Listen to the tone. Oh, I see. Coffee. Right. He was found dead days later. Brussels sprouts. That's... (laughs) Sorry, I'm just... (laughs) You're not taking this seriously, I feel. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm trying to think. All I'm thinking is he walked away from that lunch going, oh, we didn't have green beans. I hate green beans. <laughs> he's still shouting, going, I'm going to poison you. <laughs> so he's dead. So he's now dead. He's dead. He's dead. Oh, he's dead. He's dead. <laughs> the Borgia's assassination method of choice mm-hmm. was cantrella. Ooh, okay. What? A mythical poison. A mythical poison. So it's not real. Well... No one knows if it's real. It's Ooh, much like the, the Aquatafana. Aqua oh, I like it. It is like written it. about, but no sample has Ooh. ever been found. No sort of precise recipes. How convenient. Have ever How been, convenient. Have ever been found. Some said it was a mix of phosphorus, um, lead acetate and arsenic. Th- that'll do it. In other, more vivid accounts, cantarella is made by sprinkling arsenic on the entrails of disemboweled pigs. Um, this mixture is then left to fester. After a couple of weeks, the entrails are then wrung out to get all the entraily goodness um, out. <laughs> and the mixture left to dry and then ground into a powder, which is a nice. classic way of making a poison. It is, yeah. It sounds like on to be <laughs> <laughs> that, those but, terrible, terrible sausages. But just with less arsenic, probably, hopefully. That seems like a stupid way of just doing the arsenic. Like you spread it on like putrefying entrails and then wring out the arsenic. Just give them fucking arsenic. But this makes it... Do you just want them to really get sick well, yeah, with I it think just that, I because think of the just, piggy goodness? I think it's just all that dramatic piggy goodness that everyone Or loves. is it the logic that everything that smells or tastes a bit like bacon, people will eat? There is that, absolutely. But, Cantrella, it was said to have had a very sweet taste to it. Would it be the pig? Yes, that would have been the pig. Mm-hmm. It was It was very sweet, so it could very easily be mixed in with wine and food and no one would have known it's there. I like it. Oh, how conv- Again, this very convenient mythical poison that no one can detect. Yeah, I, I, have, I have a feeling that the, the, the pig method may be a slightly <laughs> later um, <laughs> exaggeration um, on, on things, potentially. But if anyone's tried it, then do let us know. Borgias are getting a lot of pigs delivered. <laughs> Each member of the family was said to have had their own preferred method of administering this poison. Okay. Cesar um, had a lion's head ring, two sharp teeth that would prick the skin of his victims when he'd shook hands. Yes. And the poison would be transferred in these little needles in the bottom of his ring. This is what we like. We like (laughs) bitey poison rings. Bitey poison. No, Rodrigo the Pope has an even more discreet and peculiar method. Okay. He would invite his okay. intended victim into his papal chambers, into his apartments. All right. And then, as he's, he's an elderly chap, he would ask them to help with a particularly with a cupboard, 
with a particularly stubborn lock. <laughs> Like, I've been trying for weeks to get into this cupboard. It's got okay. my favourite DVDs in there. Can you come and give me a hand? And he what? hands the key over to his victim. The The key is f- made with lots of little spikes on the key. And as the person clasps the key, to oh, turn to, it to in the apply lock. apply pressure. They applied pressure. And all mm. these little pinpricks would go into your hand. <laughs> and the poison was... <laughs> injected into your system oh, i am just picturing a mini mace that there's being handed over <laughs> please take this key that is a very strange key <laughs> no just hold it for a bit and then turn the lock that's a very elaborate way to poison very, someone <laughs> but who would suspect who would suspect who would a thing suspect the pope and, and the would you if the pope asked you to open a cupboard would you really say no fuck off pope um okay. open your own cupboard yeah, you just need to help you just want to be helpful in front of the pope exactly suppose, you want to be yeah. helpful you want to go to heaven open yeah, exactly. the pope's cupboard is going to it's a very help. laborish way kind of like the pope comes in help me shift this will you bruv yeah yeah exactly so right okay that, that's where the wine was so everyone's going yeah right i'll try and open uh, it. the communion wine get in there <laughs> Now, Lucretia's method is probably most famous of all. Yay! She had, she was said to have had a hollow ring with a hinged lid filled with cantrella. And she had perfected the motion of pouring a glass of wine and emptying the contents of her ring into the glass in one fluid motion that no one would ever notice. Yes! Oh, it's so good. As she, and then now she would walk over to her victim, slowly swirling the glass of wine to release mm. the aromas of the wine. The poison would be mixed. I don't. I haven't actually watched the Borgias, the TV series. So if, someone, <laughs> if they've done it, maybe. But you can just picture the cinematic kind of the slow mm. motion twist of the hand, the swirling of the glass, the the rising of the Carmina Burana behind them. <laughs> she hands it over. <laughs> Just yes. Oh, great. Like a poison ring. As the Pope gets older, his lifestyle becomes ever more extravagant. (laughs) So many cabinets. So you have no idea. In 1501, (laughs) the Pope hosted a gathering that becomes known as the Banquet of Chestnuts. Um, (laughs) Did he gather trees? (laughs) Oh, you just wait. Okay. Okay. In his apartments in the Vatican, yeah. uh, the Pope has invited friends, potential allies to a great feast mm, to yummy. celebrate his success and that of his family. Um, at the end of this great meal, the entertainment begins. Okay. Fifty courtesans dance into the room. Sexy. Or floaty veils and breasts and things. <laughs> That's your idea of what female entertainment is. Yes, I don't know. Because you look away. Just, oh, it's funny, veils of breasts. I think at this time, that's what it was. They just had veils over their face bumping into furniture with their tits out. <laughs> the tables were all moved to the edge of the room. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And the, the candelabra was all placed on the floor. <laughs> Chestnuts are strewn around... Is this some sort of early parlour game? Are these people breaking their necks on the floor? They're having a much more jolly time than that. Okay, they've got chestnuts on the floor, fire. They're blindfolded yeah, well, and naked. Beaut- they're not blindfolded. No one's blindfolded in this. <laughs> Very very um, Beautiful silver <laughs> candelabra illuminating the writhing courtesans on the floor and chestnuts. <laughs> Nothing like a snack when you're writhing. You know? Well, absolutely. The, the, the now naked courtesans crept on hands and knees between the candles, right. collecting the chestnuts and depositing the chestnuts and no. themselves uh, into the laps of enthralled guests. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What did you think they were doing with the well, chestnuts? You said there, depositing today? the chestnuts somewhere. I didn't know. <laughs> it was very early ping pong. I don't know. <laughs> Why are chestnuts sexy? I don't, I don't know. Chestnuts are sexy. Just, All that peeling of a chestnut. And they're, and they're roasted and warming. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they're hot chestnuts that you get. Some sort of Dickensian thing has crashed in here. But yeah, so they're just rolling around on nuts in the candlelight going way. And then no, I think they're, sort of, they're sort of like picking them up in seductive ways. And <laughs> creep, I don't know. That's what they're doing. Can someone, put, don't do it naked, but can someone try and reenact this fully clothed? Please put on an yeah. outfit and writhe around with some chestnuts. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't think there was a huge amount of writhing. You just said they were like rolling around, like, oh, la, la, well, no, the sexy yes, dance. Creeping along, sexy, sexy, sex, sexy sex, chestnut sex. dance. Well, you, I mean, you've got to get on the floor, otherwise you're bending down every two seconds. Chestnut, oh yeah, no, they're, they're, they're hands and, they're hands and <laughs> knees, sort of thing. Right. Now, the <laughs> Pope Rodrigo and Cesar and Lucretia 
watch on from a balcony above yeah. and watch this unfolding debauchery of chestnuts and naked guests mm-hmm. and courtesans. Ringside seat, yeah. At the end of the evening, prizes are handed out to the, to the guests who have performed most enthusiastically <laughs> and frequently what? with the chestnuts and courtesans. Um, right, okay. On one account, there were servants in alcoves with clipboards going, oh yes, well done yes, you. Yes, well done you. Ten points for you. you do, how did <laughs> they perform? Was it just them just not questioning the chestnuts? <laughs> no, I think there was a lot of sex going on. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 oh. Chestnut-based right. sex. Oh, they were actually shagging then? They, they weren't were just actually, like sitting on the... shagging. Oh, right, full-on shagging no, no. rather than just seduction. No, no, I think they, they swiftly moved past the seduction. Just, a, just on a... Hill of chestnuts shagging onto full on orgy. Oh, okay, fine. Oh, go, you know, I was what? trying to be subtle and discreet <laughs> about this whole thing, but no, you forced me to say it was a massive free for all shagging. Everyone, there's not enough prizes for good shagging. <laughs> I often wait for mine. Good shagging deserves prizes. Yes, perhaps that tells you something. <laughs> That's why you have not got a prize. I don't know. <laughs> not enough chestnuts. That's the thing. I'm not getting the chestnuts <laughs> right. What is, you're not getting the chestnuts out enough. Tonight, so that's, that's it, it. I'm rolling around on some chestnuts in front of my husband with a veil on. Da, 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 da. I did not need that image. Because <laughs> you can also picture my husband's face going, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> why don't you sleep on the sofa? Anyway, so prizes are handing out for the sex festival. Great. Yeah, Absolutely. Now, how does a man who throws such excellent parties end up a black bloating corpse lying in the Sistine Chapel? How could such a man ever have enemies um, yeah. if he was having such a jolly time? Indeed. One swelteringly hot night in 1503, um, Rodrigo and Césaire arrive at the home of Cardinal Adriano Castelli, mm-hmm. um, a man who has been a constant thorn in the ambitions um, of the Borgias. As a peace offering, the Borgias have brought with them a very lovely bottle of wine. Oh, delicious. Oh, lovely. The lovely, the lovely wine. wine. They bought the a lovely, lovely wine. wine. It's very gratefully received by their hosts and swiftly whisked away um, by a servant. Throughout the night, the two Borgias try to keep track of the wine. Where Where is it? Where is it being poured? What's going on? Oh, they're but just they... those people who have brought their own wine to a dinner party and then they insist on drinking that wine that they bought. No, Bastards. no. They very much don't want to drink that wine that they oh, bought. Oh, right. Oh, that's, oh, so they're those people. So rather than the nice people. wine, they brought the three ninety nine shit that they picked up from a supermarket. Like, yeah, I won't have that. I'll have that shabby. No, it's on the I side. Want the, I want the nice wine, yes. um, not the wine that I brought. But unfortunately, they lose track. By the next day, the two Borgia men and the Cardinal have been taken violently ill. Oh, no. Lost track of the wine, which turns out to be full of poison. Full of poison. Surely not. Yes, I know, but very. it seems like an amateur mistake. Yeah, if you're going to go to a party and bring wine that you know is going to probably be mixed into a giant vat. Yes, don't poison that wine. Mm, um, also, no, this, no. Or th- to your host, go, this is very special wine. Save this for a special occasion. Exactly, this is fancy wine. The Cardinal and Cesar, both young and healthy men, survive their encounter with the Cantrella poisoning. But the aged Pope Alexander VI did not survive. Despite the papal doctors prescribing the very latest in medical advancements, uh, being suspended in a barrel of ice water for an hour <laughs> to cure the poisoning, but even this cutting-edge treatment was not successful. There are a lot of hipsters who would swear by that right now. <laughs> They're all Iceman Hoff and everything. He's great, he's great, don't get me wrong, but there's They'd be like, yeah, if you just spend an ass, you know, in ice, in ice water, and then, you know, that's going to clear everything that's wrong with you. Yeah, or the, yeah, the, the yeah, poison. Yeah. All that's, the poison, that's, that's, it's that's just going to reject all system. of the bad energy. Right. They tried it 600 years ago. It did not work then. Oh, um, God damn it! <laughs> and very soon, the reign of the second Borgia Pope was over. In the chapel, we have this fast decomposing body. No one can stand to be near it for too long. And eventually, after a respectable mourning period, the body is quietly shipped to a nearby church where carpenters and porters attempt to jam it into a coffin. <laughs> that turns out to be several ties, sizes too small mm. because how much the body has it's bloated, up yeah, and has bloated. They can't actually fit him into this coffin without cramming <laughs> him in there. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's an elegant way for a pope to go. It's, isn't it's, a, it? it's yeah. a great way for a pope to go. The new pope, Julius II, is a sworn enemy of the Borgias, um, mm. and without his father's backing, Caesar is forced to flee with a small number of men that had remained loyal to the family. He is eventually killed in battle in 1507. He is buried in Spain under the inscription 
Here in a scant piece of earth lies he whom all the world feared. Which is a good epitaph. That's a good epitaph. I, I want like that epitaph. That. Yeah, I want that. Yeah, yeah. We both have it. It's fun. We're both going to die of poisoning. They're <laughs> saying, "Oh, that's a good end." Yes. But what of Lucretia? Yes. What, what of, of Lucretia? <laughs> the most famous Borgia of them all. Of them all. She had been married off yet again to further her father's and brother's ambitions. She had married Alfonso Des, the heir of the Duke of Ferrara, and away from this vicious backstabbing world of of Rome and the Vatican, she thrived. And she outlived the entire rest of her family. Mm. And she died peacefully in 1519, her loving husband by her side. The reputation of Lucretia Borgia is entirely unfounded. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Her father and brother, absolute bastards. um, No doubt about that. They killed plenty of people poisoning murder Mm. bit of of girls stabbing all over that lucretia borgia as far as most people can tell didn't kill anyone (laughs) (laughs) yay (laughs) she was there in the background she happened to be there she happened to be there she was and she was married into a a wealthy and and Mm. powerful family her father and her brother they were bastards but they were men they were mm. meant to be bastards living in a yes. hard tough life so they were fine the reputation of the borgias meant that any of the women lucretia they she wasn't a tough woman she wasn't a woman supporting for her family she was an evil witch um, who poisoned <laughs> men and did vastly evil nasty things where her brother did even worse but he was a fine upstanding young yeah. gentleman who did it for the honor <laughs> of his family so is a common theme that we find with exactly. the women of history women who are associated with any sort of power whether they are noble women or whether they are queens and particularly italian women they are associated with poison and just being evil so it just sort of goes to show the what we're still living in today nick still (laughs) living in today the bloody sexism that's out there is lucretia borgia's name endured as well she must have been the evil she is the evil machinations behind the scenes the scheming thing that only a woman could do whereas a man ah he just had to kill someone so lucretia borgia unfairly Ab- remembered in history unfairly remembered in history probably did nothing wrong uh she probably <laughs> killed a few people he might have killed a few people just a few just a, just just a, few. a couple you know you had to do a couple it was a style of the time it was a style of the time so i rambled on for that story <laughs> much longer than i had intended amazing story they're so their tale of lucretia borgia guys you have been educated but where one life ends Another begins Ooh. in 1519. Nice. But before we can even go on and even approach another story, I think it's time for another cocktail, Nick. Oh, Nick definitely needs another cocktail. Yay! Um, my, my throat is parched. <laughs> so much rambling. This is great because we get to now share the, the, the responsibility. Normally in one episode, it's one person talking and like just trying to reach for the cocktail while the other person's like... Da, 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 da. So the gunmetal blue, the first cocktail, not without its charms, a little oversweet for us, I think. Yeah, it gets a little bit perfumey. But you know what? We drank it. So you said there were two. You promised two, Nick. You promised two. I did promise two. two. I, I am really rather concerned because I think this one's going to be worse. <laughs> oh, God. What? <laughs> okay. But we'll find out. We'll find out. Okay, so what have you come up with for, for number two for Catherine de Medici? Our, our second blue-blooded cocktail would have been perfect for one of my Patreon episodes. Okay. Because we are having a China blue. Oh, a China blue. Ooh. So if, if we had done cocktails for Patreon, it would have been grand, but we don't, so we shall do it here. All the non-Patreon subscribers are going, what? A China blue. Good. It's time for another cocktail. So we're going to go back into our isolation kitchens and once again, shake up a storm. We'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. We're back again. Again. With our, what's it called again? China blue. China blue cocktail. Another blue beauty. I must but say. But yes, it's, it's, it's a different shade, different kind of blue. It is. Whereas the other one was a bit more of a translucent sort of blue. This is a bit more of a, a solid yes. sort of colour blue. I don't, I don't know. Murky sounds weird, but it's, it's yes, still not, not murky, gorgeous. You would use this colour to paint your bathrooms. That's what you do. You wouldn't use it. I mean, it would be inspire you. But if you had a bathroom <laughs> in that colour, 
It, I mean, you could just go in there with this drink and throw it at the walls and see what happens. It's an option. I may do that later. See later. how Friday night goes. But another beautiful blue drink for our blue bloods. Yes. So it's a different... We, we put it in a different glass this time. <laughs> I put it in a martini glass. Yeah. You put it Why in not? a mug, apparently. <laughs> what have you got? It's not in a mug. Oh, your little mm. fancy pretty nice thingy. Okay, right. So we have to dive it in taste before Nick tells me what's in it. I'm worried. Smell it first. I'm, I'm, smell I'm, it? I'm oh, it smell it first. Oh, perfumey. Again, oh, God, bloody hell. More perfume. <laughs> floral. Floral, though. Nice. So I'm not getting the mezcal kind of smokiness. Give it a go. Okay, well, let's dive in. Give it a try. I'm waiting. Hang on. <laughs> I like that. I prefer this one to the first one. I do. I prefer this one because I was waiting because I was like, I'm waiting for it to go wrong. Like the first one <laughs> did. Like the first one was, yay. And they were, oh, no, too perfumey. Oh, yeah, definitely mm. floral, but... Oh, it's got a bitter aftertaste, which I quite like now because of the sweetness beforehand. That's interesting. Yeah, that is. Oh, yeah, I do prefer that one. Talk me through it. So this, well, obviously, uh, blue curacao, unsurprisingly. Yes. Grapefruit juice. That's, yes, which yes. Which has got that slightly bittery at the back of the throat aftertaste. type thing. Lemon. Lemon juice. Lemon. A bit of sour. And the florally thing. Yes. Lychee. Use the lychee syrup I again. I managed to find somewhere yes! that after buying a really bottle of lychee liqueur, and now we've now used it for two cocktails. I'm very happy with I that. I do like that liqueur. The times when I was able to go to your house last year, I did keep picking up the lychee. Like, I'll have some of this. I'll have a wee dram of that. So we've got another one, which is, yeah, a winner with the, with the lychee. That is um, really nice. I was really worried when I smelt it. I was like, oh, have you, are you just trying to yeah. freaking use up that peach stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go, oh, no, no, no peach in this one. No, that balances beautifully. That's everything the first one should have been. I'm not a fan of grapefruit juice normally or grapefruits, but love it in a cocktail, love a Paloma. And that's delicious. Delicious. We got one right. One out of two ain't bad. Yay. Oh, lovely, lovely. China Blue. Could have had a better title, I feel. Oh, I don't know. I quite like that. China Blue. Yeah, you would because you love China. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> well, with our China Blue cocktails firmly in hand, Nick, are you ready for another story? Oh, another one. Another story. You're spoiling us. Indeed. Well, we are staying on the historic Deadly Blue Bloods theme. And where one life ends, as I said, another begins in 1519. We are telling the story of Catherine de' Medici. Nice. One of my favourite figures of history. One of the most famous members of the famous Medici family. Mother of three kings. One of the most powerful women in regal history who would become known as the Black Queen. And might have been quite the prolific poisoner, if rumours are to be believed. And someone who really did know her way around a poisoner's cabinet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> ah. Now, I can't possibly cover all of Catherine de' Medici's life in this episode because she's too brilliant, she's too fascinating, and she's got such an amazing history. So I urge you go and read about her. But I'm going to cover the early life of Catherine de' Medici to give you a bit of background on it because I feel like she does need to have some explanation rather than just being portrayed as this evil queen that a lot of people see her as. Like Lucretia Borgia, for some reason, this scheming, powerful woman. Now, Catherine de' Medici really did have power and she did have status, yes. but she had to fight for it. And yes, there were some black points in her life, but did she deserve the reputation that she was given? So I shall cover a portion of her life and some of the more famous poisoning allegations that were laid at her door. So yes, Catherine de' Medici was born in 1519, the same year that Lucretia Borgia died. That's the, quite the coincidence, really, isn't it? Yeah. So... When you said that, I was like, oh my God. Uh, born in Florence, as you can imagine. Yes. So she is from the Medici family, born to Lorenzo de Medici and his wife, uh, whose name I love, Madeleine de la Tour de Avon. Say that one again. <laughs> I messed up the end there, I think. Madeleine <laughs> yes. de la Tour yes. de Avon. Ad Avon. Ad Avon. It's, it's a lot of vowels together with a V in there <laughs> and an N at the end. So yes. So she is born into this prestigious family. Within a month of her birth, both parents are dead. Oh. Yes. Natural causes. Natural causes. So she didn't kill them. She didn't come out just wielding arsenic. She may have been born into a line of famous poisoners because being Italian, you're basically a poisoner from birth, essentially. You're a poisoner by nature. 
which is yeah, what a lot of people believe. No, she did not kill her parents. They died of natural causes. Daddy, maybe from syphilis. Let's just gloss mm-hmm. over that. It's a sort of a, a not idyllic childhood for her. She starts off okay. She's bandied around to various relatives who are trying to decide what to do with her for their political advancement. Her one big thing is that she has her uncle is Pope Clement the Seventh. Always handy. Yes. Yeah, Pope is an uncle, Pope is a dad. Pope in the family, all very, very good. But she's a girl, as we've talked about before. She's going to be bandied around and say, who does she stay with? Who do we, how do we protect her and then use her as leverage later in her life? Because while at first she lives in state and she's called the little duchess she's given a duchy in different places and you know she's she's going to have a nice life medici rule is overthrown in 1527 and she suddenly goes from being a little duchess to being surrounded by enemies in florence Mm -hmm. so it changes from her either staying with pope clement or staying with an aunt or uncle or in these quite nice places of state to her having to be squirreled away and hidden in convents as a child. No one enjoys being hidden in a convent. No, nobody enjoys that. Well, as she she said, it was one of the happiest times of her life. Oh, fair enough. I stand corrected. <laughs> she said she liked the simplicity. The simplicity of life at the convent. Can't argue with that. She is very bright as a child. She must know that she is being used and being passed around from family to family and everyone's talking about the advancement of her name and the advancement of Rome and the advancement and the defeat of her enemies who aren't her enemies, she's just a child. And it's during the siege of Florence in 1529, Charles V of Spain, who has sided with the Pope and he has been proclaimed the Holy Roman Emperor, he's trying to take control of the city. He's invading Florence. Catherine's life as a result is perilously in danger. She has been taken hostage by the opposing side in Florence and put in the convents and they're all now talking about what do we do with her she's a Mm. you know she's a pawn we could use her there calls for her to be chained naked to the walls of the city nice jolly Mm. yeah just put up there as a sign for the you know advancing armies that's always good Uh, we could just kill her Ah, an option Uh, we could march her naked through the streets another option yeah give her to the troops for their entertainment less fun I would imagine less fun yeah. Or give her to a brothel so she would be devalued for the Pope. <laughs> she's ten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so great. So she's listening to all of this. She's apparently very shrewd. I heard one historian talking about when the enemy are advancing to maybe come and get her from the convent. Literally, you know, her life hangs in the balance. Very, Quite literally, you've got the people who are going to save her marching up. They've got the people coming to the convent deciding, are we going to kill her? Are we going to chain her up to the walls? Are we going to rape her? And she comes out disguised as a nun. I think she actually cuts her hair and she wears a nun's outfit because she feels that they won't drag a nun through the streets. They would drag a little princess, but they won't do that to a nun. So she's quite shrewd. Mm. But she is luckily saved at the 11th hour and she is returned to Pope Clement in Rome. Tears of joy at seeing her. Thank God our little, our little, you know, Catherine has been saved. The next thing to do, marriage! Marriage! Absolutely, yes. Yep, that's what you do with women. Can't sit around for too long. That's what they're there for. Yeah, if she needs safety in life, she's got to be married off. By now, she's about 12 years old. When you're talking about marriage, you've got to weigh up how she looks. Well, of course. So there's various reports of Catherine. And these come when she's still quite young about her appearance. She's small of stature, thin. Well, she's fucking 12. (laughs) Without (laughs) delicate features, but having the protruding eyes peculiar to the Medici family. (laughs) Protruding eyes. Protruding oh, those, eyes. Those springy goggles. <laughs> She's skinny and got really big eyes. Uh, the eyes are not well coloured. So they're going to bland yeah. eyes. Um, but the thing they put in later on is that, oh, but she has lovely hands. Well, that's a... That's, a... <laughs> that's, that's oh, that's a bitch move, isn't it, really? <laughs> You've got lovely hands, trust me. <laughs> they say her face is heavy looking and there's another report later that her body is undeveloped and someone declaring that altogether this little girl does not look like she will become a woman for at least a year and a half my god how can anyone wait so long <laughs> but luckily luckily as pope clement is appealing and making conversations around the world to try and find a husband for catherine to find a match going to england going to scotland going to all the places francois the first of France comes a knocking. Hello. He needs a wife for his second son, Henry, Henri. Henri. Now, Henri, or Henry, let's call him Henry, was an indirect line for the throne. Hmm. Obviously, son son number Hmm. one, Francois. 
the other Francois. There's a lot of Francois in this. You're going to have to keep up. But Henri is um, not in line for the throne. So he's very much the backup son. He's the spare, isn't he? The heir and he's the spare. And Catherine is technically not of noble birth. You know, the Medici family are powerful and they ruled Florence, but she's not a princess. She's not noble at all. The duchy that she was given when she was younger is kind of like in name only by the Pope. So it's a suitable match they feel she can live as a princess in france pretty comfortably so it is that catherine and henry are wed in 1533 bride and groom are about 14 at this time no, not uncommon no, well, absolutely not no it's a very lavish affair in marseille oh, no doubt. oh lots of dancing gift giving and jousting nice we love a bit of jousting and the young couple when done with all of the frivolity of their wedding day spend their wedding night in the usual way with your father-in-law watching absolutely Make sure things yep. are done properly. Francois I is, of course, in the room to make sure the marriage is consummated. He later notes that each had shown valour in the joust. <laughs> well, they went at it for a bit. Again, the next morning, Pope Clement turns up, like, crack of dawn to check in on them and check that they're shagging and gives their nuptials blessings. It's like your creepy Pope uncle comes yeah. up and is like, how's it going? How's it going? How was it? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> After the wedding... Catherine is ready to settle into this life with her husband, Henry, who she has great affection for. You know, she doesn't know him very well, but she has fallen in love with him. But Henry buggers off travelling for the first year of their marriage. He's off roaming around the countryside. Catherine's left to tend to court. But she makes a very positive impression on the court. She's very intelligent. She's very witty. She really impresses her father-in-law as well because she can banter and she can, you know, she has great discourse with them. Hold her own. Excellent. She can. She's elegant. And she has brought with her from Italy some of the very latest fashions. Oh, of course. Now, there's all sorts of rumours about Catherine de' Medici and the things that she brought to France or to the world from Italy and she became known as. Now, one of the most famous things that she did bring over were perfumed gloves. Now, gloves, Florence, very famous for its leather, has been for decades, centuries, still is. If you, go to, if you go to Florence, you can get exceptional leather. But gloves back then, leather gloves, very, while very fine, they, 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 they didn't smell very good. No. Oh. No, they smelled of entrails and dead, dead horses, basically. That's less fun. Yeah, yeah the gloves did not smell nice at all because the tanning process while creating leather had not quite accomplished how to disguise <laughs> the horrible stench of death. So it's what one looks for in a, in a, in a perfume, the, 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 the stench of death. Exactly, <laughs> the stench of death. Well, you were saying about the entrails earlier on with the Borgias and everything like that. Oh, you'll never know, it's so sweet. Le de parfum, stench of death. Le de parfum. <laughs> yes, it's literally perfume gloves, so... In Italy, they had perfected that and she brought those over to France. And so they would be Mm. infused with perfumes like sweet orange they had and lavender and kind of different herbs and things. So you had these beautiful leather gloves. Uh, There's a legend that she introduced forks to France. Um, I think it was just that people wouldn't have seen an Italian person eating the meal in the same way that the French did. They just they thought it was different. Maybe she wasn't just shoveling it in with her hands. I think it very much was a hand based thing. All you need is a knife. Chop up your meat, and she bought a fancy fork. Well, Stop, she you brought have a to fork. Pick things up in those disgustingly French-like ways. Exactly. She had the perfume gloves. Didn't want to get them dirty. No fork. No mirror. She also allegedly introduced underwear for women in France. She brought with it because she rode side saddle, which was again a new fashion on horseback. But she started to introduce the idea of underwear for women because if you were dismounting a horse and a man came to help you because Mm -hmm. even if you're riding side saddle your skirts are going to be up high and she said it's important to wear a kind of an undergarment lest the man be given the sights of heaven (laughs) really no (laughs) (laughs) you'd just be throwing the woman (laughs) and it's not going to be well kempt as well at that sort of day and age oh god it's a real mess down there (laughs) But anyway, all all these fashions she brought to France and she was popular. But as is sort of common with Catherine's young life, she is constantly battling between she's either she's safe or she's not safe. She's safe or she's not safe. And she's smart enough to recognise this. You know, her safety in the court hangs on a knife's edge. So her position is threatened when her uncle, Clement VII, dies. So she's no longer got a link to Rome so her value plummets in the eyes of King Francois. Even though he likes to, you know, chat with her, he says it's as if she's come to me naked. So it's just she's got nothing to her. Nothing to give, yeah. Catherine is the wife, is the, the bride of a second son of a king. 
she needs to secure a place for herself in the court that is more than just a princess. If only her husband were king. I'll do it. That's the thing. In 1536, Henri and his brother, Francis, the heir to the throne, are playing tennis on a lovely afternoon Delightful. outside. They play tennis. It's a lovely sport with those weird big rackets that they had back then <laughs> that don't work. But they're playing tennis and Francis stops for a moment. He calls for a drink mid-game. Fetch me some water. Fetch me some wine and water. Put them together. Make a cocktail. I don't care. The servant who comes over to him is an Italian who has travelled to England as part of Catherine's entourage and he dutifully brings Francis a cup and Francis quaffs the beverage down and goes on to play. Within hours, Francis is gravely ill. The future king has been stricken with a mystery illness and is dead. But days later... That'll do it. Mm. And of course, rumours start to circulate. How was he poisoned? He must have been poisoned. And the servant, the Italian, is naturally hauled in front of the authorities and is... Well, he's subjected to the pointy things. The pointy things, you know, the yes, pointy, yes. The pointy questioning, much pointy questioning. And he, under the pointy questioning, confesses to poisoning. I'm thinking very much they were saying, did you poison him? Did you poison him? Did you poison him? And he probably went, yes. Okay, mm. good. We've got our confession. Yep. Yes, absolutely. He is condemned to death. His sentence is each limb tied to a different wild horse. Oh, God. Ow. And then they make the... Yes, the <laughs> wild horses run in different directions, obviously. Yes, the same direction. It was like, oh, okay, we're going over there. <laughs> oh, we're just going for a ride. This is a bit uncomfortable. So that's a version of quartered, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Torn asunder by wild horses. Torn asunder, the Italian. The Italian must have been responsible. Oh, he's Italian. Italians are all poisoners. Absolutely. But he travelled with that Catherine, that Italian noblewoman or that Italian witch who came over and is married and taken into Henry's bed. Rumours abound, but nothing obviously can be brought to Catherine's door. There is no evidence that Catherine would have had anything to do with that. We don't know. So now Henry is in line for the throne and all Catherine has to do is produce an heir. When he becomes king, and he does, she just needs to produce an heir. But there's another problem. You see, Catherine has not only been second choice in terms of a royal marriage, she's also second in the bedroom. Oh, well, that won't do. Henry has a mistress. <gasps> Scandal. Not just any mistress, a famous mistress, the beguiling beauty, Diane de Poitiers. Mm. Da, da, da. Now, this is where my history, my love of this story comes from, because this is a piece of history all centred around the Loire Valley in France, where I spent a lot of time when I was younger. And I just love how just bitchy this gets. <laughs> so Henry, when they are married, was 14. Obviously, he ages through the story. Take that as read. One would hope, yes. He was 14. Diane, 38. OK. Something to be said for the older woman, I suppose. The older woman, um, it, it is said that she she helped raise him. So, yeah, she was part of the court, helped raise the young... Yes. <laughs> but Diane, you need to know, is very, very, very sexy. Very sexy. Very sexy. Almost as sexy as our Patreon subscribers. <laughs> no one is surely that sexy. No one. As an older woman, it's interesting that she is particularly remarked on as being very beautiful because 38 back then is pretty damn old. It's ancient, really. It's, it's ancient. Oh, you're sort of alive. <laughs> exactly. But she had been quite controversial in her ways of taking care of herself with regular exercise, with doing lots of stretching, maintaining a good diet. She was the, sort of the poster girl for the, you know, for all the models later on. And she's, you know, naturally very, very beautiful, very striking looking compared to the, as we've said, lovely hands, Catherine. Catherine, lovely hands, Medici. <laughs> Catherine, lovely hands, Medici. She wears black and white are her colours. It's it's very French chic, you can imagine nice. here. Black and white are her favourite colours. She's a giant humbug. <laughs> and she stretches a lot. She can get the legs around the back of the head. She's Henry's absolute adoration for Diane de Poitiers. He adores her so much and he is not bothered about letting everyone know about it he doesn't hide it for a second he sits on her knee in court playing the guitar at her or just fondling her breasts well yeah absolutely <laughs> here's my serenade for your boobs i love your boobs so much let me add them <laughs> it went like that not only does he do this in public probably you know the, the worst slight that a man can give to a woman he wears diane's colors when he's jousting instead of Catherine's. <gasps> Can you imagine? 
Shame. 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 A scandal. Indeed. Someone else's colours. It is all desperately very Game of Thrones. It is very yeah. Game of Thrones. It. Catherine has to watch as Henry just openly flaunts his love and adoration of Diane de Poitiers. He even gave Diane de Poitiers one of the most beautiful chateaux in the Loire Valley, Chenonceau. If you've ever seen a picture of the chateau of the Loire, Chenonceau is the one with the arches and the bridge into the Loire River. It is very striking, beautiful. You can go and visit it now. It is absolutely breathtaking. And Catherine wanted it. She wanted it. That should have been hers as queen. Mm. But no, Diane got it. And Diane would have an influence through Hen- on Henry's life the whole time. Catherine actually, in the very chateau that they lived in, you can see these now as well. In certain of the bedrooms, the royal bedrooms, there are secret chambers on the side, little yes. secret passageways. Catherine would go and spy on Henry and Diane de Poitiers and their lovemaking because she realised the difference in what he was doing with her and what he was doing with Diane. Mm. And so it's very sad. Poor Catherine. She just wanted to be loved. And if you visit Chenonceau, and I will try and share a picture of this, Catherine insisted to Henry to like, put our insignia on on the walls in there and there's a room where you've got the c of catherine and the h Mm. through it and when you look at that emblem you can see a d right in the middle of it the way Uh, the letters have been placed is a d it's it's just so (laughs) so good so good so good nice not only does catherine have this problem of him having a mistress that would be all well and good but catherine is not reproducing yeah she is not producing a child in total, 10 years go by without a child. Oh, that's pretty... It's yeah. a hell of a long time. Yeah, absolutely. We could make the point that he's probably not shagging her enough because of Diane de Poitiers, but... <laughs> but they get physicians in to advise them on getting pregnant. And the, the advice ranges from the disgusting to the jaw-dropping <laughs> of what they're advised to do. So, so prepare okay. yourself for this. God. The physicians advise them to try different positions. Okay. That's definitely one thing they do. Now, there's there's some idea that Henry might have had a slight deformity or they had something in his genitals or the way his genitals were shaped did not, were not conducive to conception. There's also allegations that Catherine had something wrong with her, but the same sort of thing we talked about earlier. Oh, this woman's infertile or this, or they were barren or mm. they, they were impotent or whatever. And, oh, you know, they bl- blame physical things on them. Catherine also gets into her head that she needs to try topical treatments. So <laughs> she applies cow dung to her genitalia. Oh, that'll do it. And also ground up deer antler. <laughs> rub that on there rub that on there that'll get you going nothing will entice your man more than <laughs> covering yourself in cow shit oh dear also she drinks mule's urine yes classic so that that's a sexy night in you're lying there quaffing your mule's <laughs> urine just seductively rubbing stuff down there come and get it <laughs> The, the physicians don't help any more, as, as well as advising all these different sexual positions that they need to conceive in. There is one report from a very good historian that they advise that Diane de Poitiers be in the room well, while yeah. they are procreating. So the king would be aroused get, enough. Yeah, get the king going for a bit and then... Yeah, have Diane yeah. there so he can look at her because obviously looking at his wife is so it's hideous. Just... He needs to look at Diane and then that will get him going. Right. Mm, that is oh, that is a step too yeah. far. Yeah. So from this point in, I'm very much on Catherine de Medici's side. She's not going to be too happy at this, I feel. No. Henry's also produced an illegitimate child during this, so he can't be infertile. So pressure's on, but finally, 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 after all of the cow dung and quaffing urine and Diane being in the room, Catherine bears a son. Huzzah! In 1544, Francis, another bloody Francis. And it's broken her bad run because she goes on to have 10 more children. Well, the dung did the trick. <laughs> the did. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Everyone laughs about it. Going, oh, she put this in there. and She had 10 she had fucking 10 kids. kids. There's something to this dung. Only six survived. Yeah, well, that was just the crazy doctors that they were in going. It was the crazy doctors going, hang it upside down. <laughs> she did have a very unfortunate birth with the, the last two children. She had twins and it went very, very wrong. And both the, the babies died, unfortunately. And she just, she wouldn't conceive after that again, even though she was sort of like stocking up, as it were. It, it was quite tragic. But now Catherine has established her self and her lineage. So it's no great sadness to her when Henry dies at the wedding of her daughter Elizabeth to Philip II of Spain. I say it's no great sadness. Catherine did love henry she really did have affection for him and the way he went uh, 
Not so great. I mean, but she must have taken some comfort because he was at the wedding taking part in a joust. The kings would do that, as we know. Oh, I shall joust, I shall joust. He's wearing Diane's colours, obviously, black and white, at his own daughter's wedding. And his last match, he was soundly beaten by the dashing young Comte de Montgomery. Like a good comp. <laughs> but he is beaten by the Comte de Montgomery and he is knocked from his horse. As he lies on the ground, the aides rush to his side and they lift his visor from his armour up. They see that the lance has pierced his face through his mouth, mm. through his eye, mm. and is poking out the top of his That'll head. Do it. So it's gone through his brain. Still alive, though. Not for much longer, I feel. No, just <laughs> blood and things and jousters everywhere. Spinters of a big thickness, I think it was. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if it was a big thickness. It's something like that of a big, of, of a big largeness or something. It said <laughs> these splinters, like there's a fucking stick in your eye. Well, bigly large splinters will do it. Uh, Henry suffers long, long ten days before he dies. And Catherine was by his side the whole time. She would later take on the emblem of a broken joust Ooh, nice. as her insignia. The words in Latin were, from this come my tears and my pain. Ooh. That's very dramatic. And I like. I feel like there's a double meaning there. I feel like, you know, there's the lance broken that everyone knows that's how Henry died. And she had endured a lot of tears mm. and pain from him as well as losing a husband. So I don't know. Yeah, clever, clever like person. That. After Henry's dead, first order of business, boot Diane out of Chenonceau. Absolutely. Kick her out of the fancy chateau. Get out. She actually gives her shamble. As the chateau instead. And people differ. Chambord is my favourite chateau of all time. And, I, and this makes me sound so middle oh, class. It's I unbearable. I have a favourite chateau. I have a favourite chateau. But, you know, if you look at castles and pictures and stuff like that, it is the most beautiful place. It's absolutely stunning. And she got Chambord. Leonardo da Vinci designed the bloody staircase. But then, you know, Catherine was happy in Chenonceau. And Chenonceau is very nice. So it's the castle of... Ooh, it's the, most <laughs> it's the one castle. she wanted. But there, she's risen to power. Francis II comes into the throne at age 15, but rivalries begin immediately. Catherine is still in mourning, but the opportunists sort of start to circulate. You've got the Guise family, who are very famous mm -hmm. in this period of history. The Duke of Guise is the uncle of Mary, Queen of Scots. Yep. Mary, Queen of Scots, will be married to one of Catherine's sons at a very young age when he's four and she's six. The Guise family obviously don't like the Huguenots at all. So they're, they're quite rampant as soon as they come over to France. <laughs> and while Catherine's in mourning, the Guise family sort of like sidle in using the influence because of the link with Mary, Queen of Scots, and now one of the sons. They try and just have rampage across France and killing all the Huguenots that they we can. We don't like those. That they're Protestants. None of them. But don't like the Protestants, no. This is a very compressed history of it. <laughs> um, and this is where the political history gets very, very dense and far too dense for us to cover in this episode. But suffice it to say that Catherine bides her time. And when you look at her history here, she allows the Guise brothers, the, the two of them, to feel in control. She allows them to do certain things, but she becomes a figure on the sidelines, watching keenly and possibly pulling more strings than anyone knows. Francis II does not reign for very long. He's quite a sickly child. And on his death, she barters with those who have greater right to control of the regency than she does. She makes deals. She captures and offers family members as leverage. <laughs> so she ends up becoming governor of France. So she acts as regent, really, mm -hmm. you know, the, is the real power behind her sons. Three sons she would have who would go on to rule France. And in her older age as she's controlling these kings, these sons of hers, she is known to em employ different methods to get what she wants. She's rumoured to have her flying squadron of female spies. <laughs> nice. About 80 beautiful women uh, known from the court who would go out and bed and beguile any men or travelling dignitaries to get information and spread rumour that would aid her sons or her own machinations. And of course, of course it's said that she employs magicians and sorcerers and net romances and mystics to advise and guide her and the rumors spiral even more that Catherine being of Italian birth must be an evil woman of evil means and someone prone to poison absolutely no other explanation yes again if necromancers and talking to mystics at the time not uncommon not yeah. uncommon at all but also I mean it's not 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 possible for a woman to be intelligent and make clever plans um, she has to be guided by evil spirits and sorcerers um, to do such. Absolutely. She, a little lady couldn't possibly have come up with this by herself. Not at all. There's a lot of similarities you can draw with Elizabeth I. Yes. 
and this is the same time period, mm. Elizabeth I. Catherine's real goal when she was older was to get a marriage with Elizabeth I. She was one of the most fervent people, um, you know, putting her sons forward, imploring Elizabeth I to consider her sons as husband material. Of course, we all know how that worked out. <laughs> What a lot of people might know about Catherine is what happened around the marriage of her daughter Margaret to Henry III of Navarre. The marriage of a daughter to a Protestant. Ooh. Scandal. The war of religions is going on at the time in France. This union is supposed to help make alliances. It's not meant to be a, a Catholic will marry the Protestants and everything will be fine. No. It's gentle alliances. It's going to just smooth the way, but it famously ended in the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Before she'd orchestrated the marriage, she had pressed Henry, Navarre, Henry of Navarre's mother, Jeanne de Albret, to approve the marriage. She had written to her, she had hassled her a lot. And Jeanne was quite a dominant woman herself. And she wrote back to the Queen at one point when she was asking her to come and visit, to come and see Margaret and to help this union get together. Jeanne, in her letters back made cutting references to the rumours about Catherine being said to eat little children. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> she did. On toast. Loved them yep. at breakfast. But Catherine got her way and Jean came and she persuaded her to approve of the marriage. Oddly enough, just before the marriage took place in France, Jean wanted to go and buy a new outfit. Obviously, it's well, a wedding. Absolutely, got to get a new hat. Absolutely. So she is choosing her outfits, she is choosing her dresses, um, and she luckily already has a very beautiful pair of gloves sent to her by Catherine de Medici. Oh, how very kind. How very, very thoughtful. Yes. Exactly. And they're scented. They're so lovelyly scented. <laughs> and while she is shopping, she suddenly falls very, very ill mm. and is dead before the marriage takes place. That's pretty good, guy. And again, no one could ever trace the gloves back to Catherine de Medici. It was only rumour that she delivered them. But one of her biggest rivals and one of her most vocal opposers, even though she had begrudgingly agreed to this marriage, was now out of her way. Mm. What would happen at the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is that after the marriage of Margaret and Henry of Navarre, an assassination attempt was made on Admiral Coligny, a prominent Huguenot and an enemy of Catherine, who a lot of the Huguenots had come to Paris for this wedding in a very tentative sort of, oh, OK, we'll visit and we'll, we'll mm. condone this. And because of this assassination attempt, rumours then got back to the king, Catherine's son, that the Huguenots were going to rise up. They were going to revolt. They were going to attack them. They needed to strike before the Huguenots had a chance. And there's every indication that Catherine was whispering in her son's ear. Kill them all! Kill them all. And that's exactly what son, her son Charles <laughs> cried out. Kill them all. Kill them all. And so began the massacre in the streets of the Protestants by the Catholics across Paris. Absolute carnage. It would later last for weeks and spread outside of Paris, killing at least 5,000 people, probably as many as 30,000. Nice. So as I said, there's too much to cover of Catherine's life here. Suffice it to say, she had three sons who would go on to be kings. She would outlive all of her children except Henry III and her her daughter, Margaret, who she had locked up for disobeying her. Well, what else do you do with an unruly child? Her death is quite complex as well. I mean, it involves various rows with her son and her son killing a lot of people in the palace and then her just kind of going, oh, for God's sake. But she allegedly <laughs> died of um, pleurisy in the end. But her legend as a powerful, determined and ruthless woman lived on. But the thing that probably brings Catherine closest to my heart was the fact that in Chateau Blois, where she spent her later days, there are wood panelled rooms and these panels properly pressed would open to reveal secret cabinets where Catherine allegedly kept all of her poisons. And you can still see them today. We do love a poison cabinet. So Catherine, the creator <laughs> Of the Poisoner's Cabinet. Very nice. Da, da, da. And oh, that is Catherine de Medici. Splendid. So many good stories. We've learned so many things. Powerful women maligned in history. Always witches, always evil. Italians especially because they all started poisoning, obviously. Yeah, absolutely, yep. So if you were an Italian at that sort of time, it was like, oh, no, you're a poisoner. They're That's a poisoner. They're a poisoner. Poison comes from. But the evidence is flimsy, both against Lucretia Borgia and Catherine. And many historians feel that they've both been very unfairly Absolutely. maligned. 
they were actually very smart, very considered women in a horrible world and mm -hmm. did a shitload to survive and outlived a lot of their detractors. Random, random historical fact that came to me. You were saying about the, the Huguenots and their being kicked out of France and murdered and stuff like that. They, a, lot of them fled to, a lot of them fled to England. Mm. Um, and they are the original refugees. Yes, I did the, read the, a story the, about that, that. That phrase, well, the, the word refugee, is, mm. comes from them fleeing France and settling in, in the south of England. Many in Canterbury, where we are now. Indeed, yes, with all of the Catholics trying to burn them out of France. So what do you think, guys? What do you think of Lucretia Borgia? What do you think of Catherine de' Medici? Do you have more stories about them or favourite stories that you love about them? Were they unfairly maligned? Do we need to rewrite their history? Let's start it now. <laughs> Change it from Lucretia Borgia being the greatest poisoner of them all or Catherine de' Medici being an evil, conniving, poison glove-wielding bitch. Or are they just goddamn women in a man's world? <laughs> Yes, let's go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Comment on the episode. Come and talk to us on social media. Share your thoughts on the story and share your thoughts on cocktails. Are you going to mix up some of the blue cocktails? Do you have a blue cocktail that we haven't tried that you would suggest? Absolutely. Our two recipes, the, our gunmetal blue and our china blue, will both be out on Friday. Such excitement for you. To try for yourselves, do let us know what you think. As you say, as Sinead says, do you have a alternative blue cocktail that we didn't try i've got a bottle of blue curacao in the cupboard now it needs to get used so let us know thank you so much for can't quite believe it's been a year we've been doing this <laughs> um but thank you for sticking with us um and we hope you've loved it and we will see you in a couple of weeks for for season two as you know we're taking a tiny break after this episode to get season two ready for those of you who haven't seen on social media we are taking a short break for two weeks when we come back with season two we are going to branch out a little bit more on the historical crazy crimes we're still going to cover poisoners absolutely keep sending suggestions through but there's only so many poisoning cases in the world so we want to make sure that we're doing more crazy creepy weird humorous stuff that you guys love to hear about so now is the time to to start bombarding us with suggestions of the big ones, the small ones, the medium-sized ones, the ones that are hiding behind a cabinet. We are going to be releasing some bonus content in the two weeks that we're off, and you can come and find us on Patreon for loads of extra stories as well. Tons. And during our break, we will also release some cocktail inspiration every Friday, just to make sure that you keep drinking during lockdown. We couldn't leave you dry. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for listening to season one of The Poisoner's Cabinet. We will be back in two weeks' time with season two. But in the meantime, remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh.